I'd like to talk, uh, give you two, two lectures today, uh, two topics at least in one lecture. First is using cardiomyocytes from stem cells to model COVID-19 heart disease. And then the second is to really update you on where things stand with, uh, with our efforts to regenerate the heart. And we, we've, been making, we've been making some progress. Uh, by way of disclosure, I'd like to let people know that I've, uh, in, in the interest of translating my work into the clinic, we've, I, 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 I've joined a, uh, a startup company in Seattle called Sana Biotechnology that's working to commercialize uh, our work in heart regeneration and uh, several other areas in, in cell and gene therapy as well. I'm currently a senior vice president at Sana, so I'm dividing my time between the university and the company. So let's let's just launch. Uh, the, so part one is really going to be a talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the heart. I want to give a shout out here to Silvia Marchiano. She's featuring prominently in both of the stories. She's a, a postdoc from Italy who's just been wonderful with us. Um, Tim Martins is running our high throughput assays on COVID biology, and this is a collaboration with Mike Gale from our Department of Immunology. And Mike is really the virologist who had the, uh, the expertise in SARS-CoV-2 that we then formed the basis for the collaboration because you know, we brought the cardiac and he brought the virology. So let's launch. Let's talk about this. Uh, I suspect most of you are aware that, uh, you know, of course, COVID-19 is a pulmonary disease. That's the principal tract for the virus's infection of the human body. Uh, and most deaths from COVID are pulmonary deaths. But the second most common cause of death is cardiac disease. And cardiac patients have a variety of manifestations of injury, uh, ranging from frank coronary occlusion and myocardial infarction to troponin bumps, but uh, no, without, without obvious vascular disease. Uh, there's a thrombotic diathesis that, that's well-established. Patients have arrhythmias and they have, and they have cardiac failure as well. And the question that I have really is, is, th is this indirect injury from cytokine storm and things like that, or might there be a possibility for direct infection of the heart with, uh, with, with the coronavirus? And so that's really what we were interested in, in understanding. If, if we could use uh, stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes to help untangle some of this direct versus indirect. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't have the full answer today, but I'll provide you evidence at least to, the, the, as to what might be possible. Uh, this is a, a hematoxylin and stain section from a patient who died from, uh, from COVID-19 at the University of Washington. And what you can see here is that there is what looks like a myocarditis-like picture. We have a lot of uh, mononuclear leukocytes that are marginated around blood vessels. And then we have areas of cardiomyocyte damage where you can see uh, these kind of shrunken necrotic cardiomyocytes in association with a, a chronic inflammatory infiltrate. And so it kind of looks like a viral myocarditis, not, not perfect, but kind of. And then one of the, one of the questions is, you know, could this be uh, resulting in part from direct infection of the heart? So people, I think, uh, are, are at this point reasonably familiar with the life cycle of, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but this is a, it, it, it's an envelope coronavirus. Of course, uh, it's, it's got uh, a capsid, and then this nucleocapsid material is where the genetic material is sort of plastered on the inner side of the virus. Uh, the spike protein is quite famous at this point, and it's known to bind to the ACE2 receptor. And then when, when, on binding to the ACE2 receptor, it is endocytosed. It goes through uh, a, a variety of complicated steps, really, where it, it co-ops the machinery of the infected cell to become a viral factory. In essence, it uses a lot of subcellular membrane systems as the scaffolds uh, for viral assembly. And then this reverse process of recoding and exocytosis happens through things that we originally thought were co-opted from the Golgi and endoplasmic reticulum, but maybe there are some other ways out. And then we, we originally thought these just buttered off one virus at a time, but that isn't quite how it turns out to happen either. So that's the sort of the facts of the life cycle that we'll be, we'll be thinking about. So the first question was, are human cardiomyocytes derived from stem cells um, expressing the, the proteins that would be required for uh, a, a productive viral assembly? So th this is a Western blot, and, and here we're looking at uh, cells in the pluripotent state. These are pluripotent stem cells. No ACE2 is expressed. 
Uh, Vero cells are a positive control cell. It's a primate cell line that's commonly used for uh, coronavirus infection. And here's three different uh, types of human cardiomyocytes derived from two different embryonic stem cell lines and an iPS cell line, all expressing variable amounts, but you're sort of in the ballpark of the positive control, the Vero cells. So it seems like ACE2 is readily expressed. And this would not be too surprising because this is part of the renangiotensin system, things like that. It actually deto it detoxifies, if you will. It, it degrades uh, active ACE2 into ACE17. Uh, we, did, we looked at single cell RNA sequencing. This is UMAP analysis uh, and showing all the, the individual, I mean, everybody knows how to read these by now, I'm sure, but each of these points is, is a cell uh, that's smeared out in two dimensions here. Uh, and uh, the cardiac troponin T is, is expressed in virtually every spot. And yes, ACE2 is expressed. Interestingly, uh, only in a subset, maybe 15, 20% of the cells are above threshold for ACE2 at the mRNA level. So it's there, but it's not in every single cell is what it looks like. And then when we looked at uh, some of the other uh, parts of the viral processing machinery, if the, the proteases cathepsin B, cathepsin L are abundantly expressed. Tempris 2, this protease that sits on the cell surface that's thought to involve polishing, if you will, of the spike protein to facilitate its endocytosis, not, see, not expressed at all in the cardiomyocytes. And then this endosomal lipid kinase called PIK5 that's involved also in, uh, in the, the, the lipid-based assembly of the virions uh, is also abundantly expressed. So most but not all of the players seem to be present in cardiomyocytes and seem to be plausible at least that they could be productively infected. So here we see two different lines of stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, H7s from embryonic stem cells and WTC11 cardiomyocytes from a human uh, induced pluripotent stem cell, a female line on the top, a male line on the bottom. And we gave them uh, SARS-CoV-2 at a multiplicity of infection of five, in other words, five viral particles per cardiomyocyte. And we see the same thing with different, at different paces that these cells get classic viral cytopathic effects. They round up, they shrivel, and they die and detach from the dish. And this is the first they stop beating, perhaps not surprisingly, and then they die. So that was really quite striking. And this, by the way, has been replicated by multiple groups as well. So this seems to be a pretty robust finding. Uh, we were interested in unpacking this a little bit, like how, how does this exactly go? So we, uh, this is looking at cells at 48 hours. Uh, this was done at a lower multiplicity of infection, 0 0.1. And so you can, when you hit them with five, that's like infecting everybody all at the same time in the culture. And you hit them at 0.1, you infect a few cells and you let it, it, I call it a pandemic in a plate. You let it sweep through the plate by serial rounds of productive infection. So here we have immunostaining of these two different uh, cardiomyocyte lines from, uh, with alpha actinin. And you can see in, in, on the top, it's pretty diffuse, not really sarcomeric like we're used to seeing alpha actinin. Down here on the bottom in the WTCs, you can see some sarcomeric or myofibrils perhaps, uh, but, uh, but a lot of this is just globular or diffuse. And if we stain for this nucleocapsid from the, from the virus, you can see there is just a ton in both instances. But in the superimposed area, you can see that the cells that have preserved myofibrillar architecture are the cells that are not infected or yet to be infected cells, whereas the cells that have a lot of nucleocapsid in them have a really lousy looking cytoskeleton. And there are viral proteases and things like that that may be involved in degrading the cytoskeleton as well as the co-opting of uh, protein synthetic machinery. So we wanted to look at virus production a little more uh, uh, quantitatively. So we looked at their ability to, to form live viruses by doing plaque forming assays. This is a, a, where we count plaques in, uh, in, in cell culture. And we also did it by looking at viral genome production using RT-PCR. Uh, when we did this in this one step curve where we infect everybody all at once, what you can see is you get a burst of intracellular RNA and you get a burst of viral particles uh, in the media, and then the whole thing crashes as the, uh, as the cells die off. One of the things that this tells me is that the virus is not all that stable. You, it, it, it's relying on active manufacturing. It, 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 compared to an adenovirus, for example, which is quite tough, non-membranated, non uh, these, these uh, coronaviridae uh, seem to, to become inactive relatively quickly when they're not being actively produced. That's the one-step curve. If we do the pandemic in the plate, like I said, at a much lower multiplicity of infection, same kind of thing. It, it's just shifted to the right, and you can see that viral production is still going up. Uh, but this is this is really high. This is the the, the order of magnitude is the percent 
head of a housekeeping gene, HPRT1, and you can see the percentage is like 10 to the seventh fold. So there is a ton of viral RNA that's being made in the cell. So we next did a series of electron microscopic evaluations, and that was really informative and very fun to do. And the first thing we, we asked was, how did the virus get into the cell? So here we're, look, we're zoomed in on the sarcolemma, and you can see a coronavirus right here in what looks like uh, the process of endocytosis coming in. So the virus has its own membrane. It's presumably bound via the ACE receptor to the cell surface, and now it's being actively endocytosed. And here's a double membranated virus, which would be the result of an endocytotic event that is making its way into the cell. So that's the first route, and that's the, that's the route that everybody expected to see, I guess. Uh, what we were also a little surprised to see is direct fusion of the viral membrane with the cardiomyocyte membrane. Here you're seeing a little more, again, we're zoomed in really at, at high magnification here, but this is a, a conventional view of the sarcolemma. And then here, just because the cells are in cell culture, it's a tangential view, so a really long uh, a tangential oblique section through the phospholipid bilayer. And you can see here at higher magnification the membrane of the virus fusing with the membrane of the cardiomyocyte. So there seems to be two ways that this, this this beast can get into the cell through endocytosis and through direct fusion and just dumping its genetic material into the cell. And then when you see you know, what happens after the cells had say 48 hours to be infected, it becomes quite remarkable. Uh, one of the things that was really striking to us was we found these membrane bound vesicles that were chock full of mature viral particles. And you can see this little kind of whirly thing. You can't tell too well what that is. This is uh, a phospholipid world, which tells a structural biologist that this used to be a lysosome. So these, in, 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 as, as one digs into the lit literature, these, these viruses co-opt lysosomes to become exocytosis vesicles. So you, they pack the mature virions after their assembly into these, uh, into what used to be lysosomes, and they repurpose them and shuttle these off to the cell membrane. Quite remarkable. So here is what's happened. Here's one of these vesicles that's just fusing with the extracellular membrane, and, with, the, with the plasma membrane, and you can see all these virus, viral particles just studying the surface of the cell. Here's a, second, uh, here's a second one of these repurposed lysosomes that's also dumping out virions on the surface of the cardiomyocyte. And if you take a step back and look at it in context, you can see that this is a cardiomyocyte. Here's a very unhappy mitochondrion. Here are myofibrils and so forth. But look at its surface. It is absolutely studded with coronaviridae. Uh, really, really, uh, I really like this picture. Uh, so what does this do in terms of... Um, function to the cardiomyocyte. We looked at this through multi-electrode array analysis. So these are, here are the cells that uh, mock trans, uh, transduced and then hit with either low or high doses of virus. And over the course of this study, we didn't see frank cytopathic effects. So we presume the, cell, the cells are still viable at this stage. And then if we look at the multi-electrode array readings, what happens is voltage goes way down and rate goes way down as well in a dose-dependent manner. And this is quantified here, showing loss of frequency, showing loss of spike amplitude, and eventually showing loss of conduction velocity as well. Maybe something like this could be the substrate for arrhythmias. Don't know for sure, but maybe. How about contractility? So to, to look at this, we, we built engineered heart tissues where we cast cardiomyocytes and stromal cells into a fibrin gel. And this is a, a, a system where the, our colleague Nate Snedecki has developed. There's a rigid post on one side. It's got a glass capillary tube in it. And then on the other side, it's an elastomeric post that allows the cell to, to flex. So it's like a little cardio gym. And then there's a magnet here that allows us to do magnetic sensing. So let me just pop this up. You can see this little cardiomyocyte, or this, this uh, human engineered heart tissue in, in the gym sort of doing his, his workout when he's healthy. So we infected those, and what we saw was uh, for the first two days or so, not too much happens, but then when there's marked loss of twitch force, and shown just as representative twitch examples here, here we are at baseline, getting weaker at 72 hours, and here by 144 hours, uh, you can see there's barely any twitch force developing at all. So, summarize the first part of this talk, uh, human cardiomyocytes express the ACE2 receptor and critical viral cofactors. 
they, uh, the, the virus enters the cell through two mechanisms, by, both by direct fusion with the plasma membrane and through formal endocytosis. Uh, there, it clearly engenders cytopathic effects on the cells, but en route to cytopathic effects, it replicates like crazy and turns the entire cell basically into a virus production factory. Uh, along the way, we have both electrical and mechanical dysfunction in the infected cardiomyocytes. And my view of this is that this supports the hypothesis that there can be direct infection of the heart by coronavirus. Uh, and, and there may be long-term sequela for patients who have coronavirus heart disease, even if it's in a subclinical context. So I think we should be keeping an eye on our patients to make sure that uh, they, they do well in the long run after they get over COVID. And, and you know, I, I, my paranoia at the moment is perhaps there will be uh, people you know, coming in with more of a cardiomyopathy, post-viral cardiomyopathy afterwards. This is evidence, it's not proof, but it, it, anyway, to me, I, I, I found this a very interesting line of inquiry. So part two, let's, let's shift gears and we'll talk about uh, trying to use stem cells to regenerate the heart. Uh, I think everybody that, that's attending the seminar knows that the, the global burden of heart disease is absolutely enormous. It's the number, ischemic heart disease is the number one cause of death in the whole world. It's also the number one reason people are admitted to the hospital in the United States. It's the number one healthcare expense and number one Medicare expense, et cetera. I think the pathophysiology also is well known to everybody. Coronary atherosclerosis is followed by rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque. There is an acute ischemic event where a region of myocardium is rendered uh, deficient in blood flow. You get, a, you get a sector of myocardium that is going to infarct. And infarcts evolve quickly, but from, from occlusion to full evolution is typically six hours or so. And these can cause big cellular deficits on the order of a billion or so cardiomyocytes may be uh, lost in a typical clinically relevant myocardial infarction. Uh, the problem is, of course, the heart is about the least regenerative organ in the human body. And so we can, it, 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 there's essentially no new cardiomyocytes that are endogenously generated, and the, the myocardium is replaced by scar tissue. And in too many patients, this leads to the progression of heart failure. And I think everybody knows once heart failure is diagnosed, patients have, <clears throat> excuse me, on average about uh, five years to live. So our notion quite simple in a way, is that this is a classic disease of cellular deficiency. Can we use exogenous stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes to repair the heart? Uh, we're, we've gotten good at making cardiomyocytes and we can make them uh, of pharmaceutical grade basically under GMP manufacturing conditions. Uh, the, this is uh, the, the GMP suite at the University of Washington where we have two of our uh, staff scientists that are, that are involved in high quality cell manufacturing. Uh, so we can make them clean, we can make them in large quantities. We're working now in three liter uh, bioreactors. And uh, it's of course obligatory that I show you a movie of our beating little cardiac balls. Uh, these, are, these are stem cell derived cardiomyocytes that we make through manipulation of the Wnt pathway. We first activate Wnt to make mesoderm, then we repress Wnt to drive it down the cardiac lineage. And when we zoom in at higher magnification, you can see each one of these little cardiac steroids that may have a couple of thousand cells in it uh, is beating. Uh, it, it's synchronized within the uh, sphere, but it is, uh, excuse me, asynchronous uh, but among, among spheres. And, and that's just because of the electrical uh, communication through gap junctions. So, the, so these, and we can make these 80, 90, 90 plus percent purity. So that's what we're imagining will be good to use for human heart regeneration. So the, 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 let me bring people up to speed on where this field stands, just a couple of the highlights from the last 15 years. Uh, the, the, a, a lot of work was done using adult sourced cells. It started with cells from bone marrow, uh, moved on to cells derived from the heart itself, and then uh, cells more re most recently perhaps from adipose tissue, the stromal vascular fraction, MSC-like cells. And basically the answer for all of these things is, is this. These aren't really stem cells. They don't behave like stem cells. They don't engraft long-term. They don't differentiate into cardiomyocytes. And to the extent that they have biological activity, they work through paracrine signaling. That is typically soluble factors that, meet, that go from one cell to another. Uh, when these have been tested clinically, the, the efficacy has been limited to absent. 
I would contrast that, those with stem cells derived from pluripotent cells, and they form cardiomyocytes that meet all the everybody's criteria for making cardiomyocytes. Uh, these will engraft long term. They form new human myocardium in the hearts of experimental animals. Uh, this, we, we've shown previously that this improves. We've just worked our way up the food chain. It improves uh, contractile function in infarcted hearts of rats, mice, and guinea pigs. Um, we're still working on understanding the mechanism of action. The most obvious thing is that they could uh, that they these are new systolic force generating units that we're actually remuscularizing the wall of the heart. We know they they can beat in sync with the rest of the heart by getting uh, electrical cues from their neighbors. Uh, and so they can do that. They can be new force generating units. But of course, all cells communicate through paracrine mechanisms. And so they could be working through paracrine pathways as well. And the first few patients are just beginning. This is, this is really a nascent clinical effort. And so we'll see. We'll have to see how this works. So we, uh, for almost a decade now, have, have uh, been working in large animals. And, and we really made the jump uh, when, when we decided to, to do non-human primates. And so what you're looking at here is a, uh, a, a infarcted non-human primate heart where the, the monkey's myocardium is stained in red, collagen, the scar tissue is stained in blue, and uh, there is no graft in this particular example. So you can see that there's definite cellular deficiency or my myocyte deficiency in the infarcted zone, the wall has thinned and so forth. Uh, the, in contrast, when we transplant a bunch of human cardiomyocytes into these animals, and these animals received about 750 million human cardiomyocytes, you can see that we've succeeded in remuscularizing a chunk of the wall. Uh, the human cardiomyocytes occupy a large fraction of the infarct, and we can, you know, that we can. These are big enough that we can see them by magnetic resonance imaging. They, the, these graphs are on the order of a centimeter or so in maximal dimension. Uh, and this is a mass in, mass out relationship. You have to put a lot of cells in if you want to achieve a large muscular graft. Here is the mechanical uh, effect of, of transplanting these cells into the heart. Uh, this is magnetic resonance imaging using uh, to look at ejection fraction on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. The treated animals are in blue and the control animals are in red. And you can see that the normal mechanic ejection fraction is about 65%. With a large LAD-related uh, infarct, this drops about 25 points to an average of 40% or so, and you can see good overlap between the groups. And then the animals that receive a sham injection and plus immunosuppression, uh, there, there is no improvement in contractile function over a three-month period, whereas animals who receive the human cardiomyocytes improve 8 to 10% by uh, four weeks and, and a full 20 plus points by 12 weeks. For these guys out here, if we didn't know that they had an infarct, we wouldn't be able to tell from measuring their, car their heart's function. So this is the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning. It makes me think that if we can take, if human cardiomyocytes can do this in a macaque monkey, they should be able to do this in a human being as well. This is the thing that keeps me up at night. Uh, all, I, I console myself by saying all potent medications have toxicities associated with them. And the, the principal toxicity that's been associated with human cardiomyocyte therapy has been what we, what we term engraftment arrhythmias. And here's a representative example of a rhythm trace, a, a, a period of normal sinus rhythm, and suddenly this really rapid ventricular tachycardia ensues. And it, it can be quite abrupt. Um, the, this seems to happen in multiple species. It works, it, it happens, this is from our first paper where we described this with human cardiomyocytes going into the monkey. You can see that uh, the, the vertical line here represents when the cells are transplanted post infarction and the animals go in have actually quite a bit, uh, you, this is hours per day and in this one animal it was over 20 hours a day for a period, uh, but then it comes back out, they come out of the woods. Same kind of phenomenon when um, monkey cardiomyocytes are transplanted into monkey hearts enter uh, ventricular tachycardia and then come back out. And then most recently, Mike Laflamme's group shown in Toronto that transplanting human cardiomyocytes into the pig heart causes the same kind of phenomenon as well. Uh, a key point here is that monkeys tolerate this pretty well. Uh, they, the, the, it's a nail biter for the, for the animal people, but, uh, but, but, the, but the animals are not in acute distress. Pigs do not tolerate this particularly well. These two arrows indicate animals that died of sudden cardiac death, for example. And so uh, pigs are more sensitive. 
And we've asked ourselves again and again, which, which of these is predictive of a human? And we, short answer is we don't know. So we take this very seriously. So we have been working diligently for years to try to make this engraftment arrhythmia, to understand its pathogenesis and to make it go away. So he, what, we, what we, we began by doing some electrical mapping studies. And we, we took a unipolar electrode and, and did mapping of the endocardial surface of the heart, much like one would do in a, in a patient where you're trying to understand the origins of their VTAC. So this was, this was a monkey heart. The apex is in the lower right. The base is in the upper left. Each one of these little crosses is a place where we actually place the electrode, and then the, it's interpolated in between. So it's a relatively low-resolution map of ventricular activation. I'll just remind you of Physiology 101. Uh, activation should occur at the apex and sweep towards the base where um, ejection of blood it takes place. In this animal in ventricular tachycardia, it originates here at the anterior septum and moves out centrifugally from that. It looks like a point source in a very low resolution map, and it, we did not see something that looked like a rotor to suggest re-entry. So that was interesting. We did a, a I'm going to stop this uh, video. So we mapped it. It looked like a focal source that favors automaticity as a mechanism. We tried to pace our way out of this. We could capture it. We could make VTAC faster by, with, 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 by, by electrical pacing. We could take it up to 300 beats a minute, for example, from 250. Uh, but as soon as we shut the pacemaker off, it went back to the, the baseline tachycardic rate. That favors automaticity. We tried to cardiovert our way out of this, uh, which uh, that typically works for reentrant tachycardia. But after a very brief pause, this resumed, uh, resumed tachycardia. That favors automaticity. And we finally tried to induce this when the animal was spontaneously out of the rhythm. We tried to reinduce it by programmed electrical stimulation, and this rhythm was not inducible. So all of these lines of evidence favor automaticity. And you, just to, to, to remind people who don't think about arrhythmias all the time, there's two fundamental fork. There's a fork in the road where you, it's either a disorder of impulse generation or a disorder of conduction and conduction slash reentry. And this is like clinical grade evidence that favored uh, impulse generation disorder, which we are calling automaticity. We had to make a, we had to make a choice. It wasn't perfect evidence. It wasn't, it wasn't like proof. It wasn't like genetics. It's like clinical decision-making, but we decided to pursue the automaticity route. So that led us to, to come up with a hypothesis. This automaticity is the result of either electrical currents that are normally absent in mature ventricular myocytes, but are present in the graphs, or from the absence of currents within our graphs that are normally present in ventricular cardiomyocytes. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's either they've, they've got something they shouldn't or they're missing something they ought to have. Uh, we know that electrical currents are conducted by protein channels. These proteins are encoded by genes. So we reasoned we should be able to gene edit our way out of this, either through a judicious use of knockouts or overexpression in the graft cells and have an impact on engraftment arrhythmias. So we set out to do this. Uh, this is something that's come to be known as Project Medusa in the laboratory. Uh, and this is a fairly outrageous acronym of modifying electrophysiological DNA to understand and suppress arrhythmias. <laughs> this has been led by a great group of people, a whole team, but the three principals here are Silvia Marchiano, again, uh, the same postdoc who led our COVID efforts. Uh, she's really been a terrific postdoc. Hans Reinecke, a long-term senior scientist in my laboratory, and Alessandro Bertero, an absolutely brilliant postdoc who's now gone back to Italy to start his own group. So without them, I would have nothing to talk to you about. And here's the workflow. We start with the universe of all known ion channels. And then we, we take prior knowledge about cardiac electrophysiology. Who do we know to be the important players? And I, haven't, I won't have time to show you, but we've done RNA sequencing on our graphs from day one to about three months afterwards. And so we know their expression profiles as they go through this vulnerable period of arrhythmia and then go back out of it. And so by intersecting these, we've come up with a candidate list for gene editing. And so we edit them at pluripotency. Then we make cardiomyocytes. We test them in vitro and look for things with interesting phenotypes, particularly influencing automaticity. And then we test them in vivo. 
Uh, this looks like it's something that could have some throughput to it, but here's the rub. The only, the only way we know how to test for engraftment arrhythmia is in large animals. It doesn't happen in mice, rats, or guinea pigs because their hearts are too fast, and we don't have any in vitro model of it. So what we had to do was grow up hundreds of millions of cardiomyocytes and transplant them into immunosuppressed pigs and track them by telemetry to see if they would get engraftment arrhythmia. So that was, that was basically our model. And we started this in January of 18. That's when we finished the design and we started the, we pulled the trigger on, on doing our first set of transplants. And I'm pleased to tell you, we finally have something that we can talk about three and a half years later. So there's a beating heart. Uh, so we do, how do we deliver the cells? We either deliver them surgically like this. You can, you may be hard to see, but this is the LAD distribution of the porcine heart. And there are five regions here where we delivered human cardiomyocytes. These are in non-infarcted animals. And we started with catheter-based delivery. And so this is an endocardial catheter that you can't really see it, I'm sure, but there's a tiny little stiletto-like needle for, for delivering cells into the wall of the heart. Uh, and then, unfortunately, Biosense Webster has discontinued manufacturing of this delivery catheter, so we had to switch to surgical delivery. And these the pigs, if you, if you get the immunosuppression right, are great hosts for, uh, for the human cardiomyocytes. These are graphs of human cardiac muscle stained here with a human cardiac troponin I-specific antibody. You can see nice myofibrils with sarcomeres and things like that. So the pig, the pig is a great host uh, as long as you get your immunosuppression right. All right. Uh, this, the, apologies in advance to electrophysiologists in the crowd, anybody who's an aficionado. Uh, I've been trying to teach uh, pacemaking to finance people recently, and this is, this is how I decided to, to, to present it to them, that the pacemaker is basically a clock. The clock has gears, and there's three components to the heartbeat. Uh, there is a leak where positive ions come in slowly. There is what I call a tick, where there is a gush of positive ions that come in uh, very rapidly. And then there is a talk where there is a resetting where positive ions run out. Of course, here we've got sodium and calcium running in, and here we've got potassium running out. And so in my view here, and this is action potential of a human stem cell derived cardiomyocyte in culture. We have the leak, we have the tick, the talk. Leak, tick, talk. These, this is a non-exhaustive list of all the genes that are involved in this. These are the ones that we ended up focusing on um, because of the, the, the algorithms that we talked about earlier. Uh, then and there's a few of your favorites that are likely missing from this. But this, these are the ones that we've been uh, editing. And this is the, the pedigree of the, the, the cells that we had. We started out with wild type cells. The little swirly eyed pig means we get engraftment arrhythmia here. And we did a series of single edits in all of these genes. Uh, and then when you start to see things down vertically, that means double edits. And so here, for example, wild type cell, we, edit, we knocked out uh, the sodium calcium exchanger and then the HCN4 channel. And then we overexpressed uh, the TOC channel, the KCNJ2 channel. So th that's, that's the way to look at this. So this is, and we didn't do all of these in pigs, but we did many of these in pigs. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story in what I hope is a succinct manner. So the first thing we wanted to do was start with the classic leak channel, HCN4, which is responsible for the funny current that everybody thinks of as, like if you think there is a pacemaking channel, it would probably be HCN4. So we knocked HCN4 out, made a bunch of cardiomyocytes, transplanted them into the pig. And it didn't work. Let me just show you how, uh, how to read these cells. I'll be showing you several plots like this over the next several slides. We look at heart rate responses and heart rate vertical and then time after transplant horizontal here. We'll show you the same set of wild type data. And you'll note the numbers are small here we, because we're looking for basically all or none phenomena. We're not looking for like a 10% reduction in arrhythmia. We want this thing to go away. So in blue will be the same wild type data. And when there's a black point, that means an animal died from cardiac related disease. So here, and then, so the, the, the heart rate goes up, but then it comes back down as the cells mature. We see exactly the same thing with HCN4 knockout, no, no difference. And here's the arrhythmia burden, the fraction of the day. And it shoots up to being three quarters of the day or so, and then it comes back down. And clearly no impact of knocking out HCN4. 
So we, we also tried uh, some others with single knockouts and they, they weren't working until we thought, okay, there's, there's, there's more complexity here. It's probably not just a single channel. Uh, we should try to, to do things in combination. So our next idea was to try to set the resting membrane potential at a more negative level to suppress automaticity. And as people may know, there's a, there's a, a current called IK1 that's encoded by a gene called KCNJ2. It's a potassium channel that's involved in setting the resting membrane potential. So we wanted to overexpress KCNJ2 in these cardiomyocytes. So we started out to engineer this. And the first thing we found when we just popped this into a safe harbor locus and constitutively expressed it is this doesn't work. Pluripotent stem cells hate to have a very negative resting membrane potential. So all of our pluripotent stem cells died. It was toxic. Okay, so then we just we, we thought about this. So we need something that'll let it go up and ideally bring it come, you know, go up as they differentiate and then ideally come back down as they mature. And then we thought, well, since we want to knock out HCN4 anyway, what if we just swap those genes? What if we knock KCNJ2 into the HCN4 locus? So we did that. And what you can see here, this is the wild type expression of case of HCN4, the, uh, the, the funny current channel as the cells differentiate into cardiomyocytes. And this is in our three knockout clones down here. So we've got knockout and nonsense mediated decay. And then when we've knocked in KCNJ2, you can see we get this nice regulated, first the cells live, and second we get this nice regulated expression where it comes up and comes down. We were, pre we were pretty pleased with ourselves, we thought, I think, you know, this, this clearly is going to work. It's too beautiful of a hypothesis. And nope, didn't work. If anything, it seemed worse. Uh, we did it in two pigs, and both of them died from complications of cardiac arrhythmias. Hmm. That was, a, that was depressing. Um, so we thought about this more, and it's like, well, maybe, maybe there's a lot of redundancy in this system, and we need to get a third level of gene editing on this. So we, we went after the next ones that seemed like they were good candidates, the T-type calcium channel and the sodium calcium exchanger. We did those individually in triple edits using as a base case HCN4 knockout KCNJ2 overexpression, right? So those are so tri triple edits basically. And here we are looking at the T-type calcium channel knockout. We did, our first animal di you know, died of engraftment arrhythmia, and we just didn't feel like doing another pig to make sure it was, <laughs> we were getting pretty discouraged. Said, okay, so it's not knocking out the T-type calcium channel, maybe the sodium calcium exchanger, which is also involved in an electrogenic current that you, that you may know about as lets in three sodiums for every two calcium that go up, for every one calcium that goes out. Anyway, we knocked out the uh, sodium calcium exchanger and also, you can see the, these almost look the same, but we had the same result, but these are different tracings. And both heart rate and arrhythmia shot up and, um, and the animal died from cardiac disease. Uh, okay, so this was, this, was, this was sort of the gut check moment where we, uh, where we were really starting to question our hypotheses. We, we thought we'd reasoned this through pretty well, but we're almost three years in. You're, we're working with postdocs who have careers to develop and things like that as well. And, you know, what, what, are we really on the right track here? And let me remind you of what we've done. Now, we started out with wild-type animals that had wild-type cells that gave engraftment arrhythmia. I showed you single knockout of HCN4. We also did a, a mechanical channel called Piezo1. That didn't work. We doubled down on HCN4 and KCNJ2. That didn't work. Uh, we did it. We tripled down on uh, the sodium calcium exchanger HCNJ4, or HCN4 rather, and KCNJ2. That didn't work. And then we tripled down on HCN4, uh, KCNJ2, and the T-type calcium channel. And that didn't work. So the question was, would a quadruple edit do the job? And so what we chose to do was another push where we, where we combined the knockout of the, uh, the T-type calcium channel and the sodium calcium exchanger on top of the HCN4 knockout and the KCNJ2 overexpression. So we did this quadruple edit, made the cardiomyocytes, and we got something very interesting.
So these cells have now, the project was originally Project Medusa. We've now just, you know how lab shorthand evolves. So these have come to be known as Medusa cells. So we came up with a cell uh, that, we, that, that looks quite interesting because it's quiescent but electrically excitable. And by the way, I'm just going to call them Medusa from now on because it's such a mouthful to list all of these knockouts that we, and, and, and overexpressions that we're doing. The first is it seems to, to completely abrogate automaticity in vitro. This is looking at uh, multi-electrode arrays where you can see a spontaneous frequency of wild-type cells. And then in these quadruply edited Medusa cells, they just sit there. They're cardiomyocytes, but they just sit there. But interestingly, if you patch onto them, here's wild-type cells with a, with a typical action potential. And you can see them here in a more compressed with, uh, with, with being paced here at one hertz. We can pace these Medusa cells perfectly fine at one hertz, and they have very interesting action potentials that are a little bit different from a, a typical IPS-derived cardiomyocyte. And the, the, how are they different? Well, the, the cell size measured by capacitance is about the same. Uh, the action potential duration measured by APD90 is about the same. But interestingly, they are relatively hyperpolarized, which of course you'd expect, expect with KCNJ2 overexpression. So the way, to, a couple of different ways of looking at their diastolic potentials, either the, the minimum diastolic potential or the baseline diastolic potential, which is right before the rapid upstroke. Uh, in both cases, they're substantially more negative in the Medusa cells. So quiescent, but excitable. So that might be an interesting cell for cardiac repair. So here's the big reveal. We put these into pegs, and it looks like in graph arrhythmia it goes away. Here's heart rate, and again, you can see heart rate stays constant basically throughout the course of the experiment. And you can see arrhythmia burden, the fraction of the day that the animal spends in arrhythmia. There's a few PVCs and things, but uh, basically no significant ventricular arrhythmias as a result of putting these in. <sighs> That was a, it was a long haul, but really a very, to us, a very interesting outcome. Now, you might wonder, well, the easiest way to get rid of engraftment arrhythmia would be to get rid of engraftment. And so the, we did, did these cells engraft? Yes, yes, they engraft just fine. Here's a human-specific uh, troponin eye stain, and you can see nice-looking human grafts in the myocardium of the porcine heart. And so there, there's at least normal size graphs. So that the absence of engraftment arrhythmia is not due to absence of engraftment. So let me, let me wind up here. What, what have I told you in the second part? Um, we can do this quadruple gene edit and it appears to eliminate engraftment arrhythmia. And it's knocking out HCN4, the, the, the funny current channel, uh, the T-type calcium channel, CACNA1H, uh, the sodium calcium exchanger, SLC8A1, and then overexpressing KCNJ2, the, the, the channel that controls resting membrane potential. The fact that we were unsuccessful in singlicate, duplicate, and triplicate says to me there is redundancy in the, in the channels that carry this arrhythmic current. And to me, it also says that you know, we're, we're, we're messing with a lot of things that are fundamental to the heartbeat of the, of the, you know, the human heartbeat. And it's perhaps not surprising that nature has built us with uh, a lot of redundancy in that. Uh, to me, this is pretty good evidence that automaticity is the mechanism of engraftment arrhythmia. Uh, and, and I guess a question is like, is this a are these cells strictly mechanistic or could these be therapeutically useful? Uh, as, and still thinking this through, but HCN4 and uh, the, the T-type calcium channel are not expressed in mature ventricular myocytes. So that doesn't seem like a, a big loss to me. And this KCNJ2 transgene, that's in a, in a locus that will silence as it normally matures. So that should shut down. And there's a lot of that current normally present in an adult myocyte. Uh, the one we're thinking about hardest is the sodium calcium exchanger, SLC881. This is abundantly expressed in mature cardiomyocytes. It's the principal channel through which cardiomyocytes extrude calcium. Uh, what, I'll, what I will remind you of is some work from Ken Phillipson's laboratory years ago that showed that you can do cardiac-specific knockouts of, uh, of this gene in the mouse, and these mice are pretty healthy. They're, I mean, there's a little toxicity, but they're, they're pretty healthy and they're fertile and, and so forth. So the, the cardiomyocyte adapts to uh, maintain calcium homeostasis. So maybe we're interested in this. Uh, and the last thing I will leave you with is, is more philosophical perhaps, which is 
you know, sometimes it pays to stick with things until they give. And um, yeah, I, I'll just leave it there. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thanks to all the horde of people who contributed to, to making this stuff work. This is a, was a joint effort both through the University of Washington and scientists at Sana Biotech. Uh, this is a, uh, a pre-pandemic shot of my group when everybody was still at the University of Washington. And then all the people I'm circling in yellow uh, moved over to Sana to help start their cardiac cell therapy program. Uh, and so, you know, anytime I've said I, I should have said we. Anytime I said we, I should have said they. This is really the work of many others that I'm just fortunate to represent. Uh, thanks also to people at, in our heart regeneration program, Rob McClellan and Nate Snedecki, who helped all of this, this stuff run. And then many funding sources that have contributed, uh, were, without whom none of this, of course, would have gotten done. And with that, I will stop. Be delighted to take questions if there's some time. Th thank you all very much for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Chuck. Uh, actually, the questions have been pouring in, and I'll try to uh, I'll try to pose them in the amount of time we have. So uh, I'm going to combine some questions if they've if they've asked the same thing. So uh, uh, Neil Chi and another questioner wanted to know uh, in your first part of your talk with regard to COVID-19. How old were your cardiomyocytes? And then relevant to the fact that, uh, you know, we all know that uh, pluripotent uh, cell-derived cardiomyocytes are somewhat immature, can you extrapolate from what you saw in a dish to what goes on in the adult human heart? And yeah. is there any uh, pathological data on actual patients to support that as well? Good, good and rigorous questions. Uh, so the, the, the cardiomyocytes are typically about three weeks post-induction. So three weeks prior, they were a pluripotent stem cell. And so they're very young. Uh, they're sort of at the stage of an early fetal cardiomyocyte, basically. Uh, and, and so this is, it, it, it's, cl it's clear that they can be infected at that stage. Does that teach us anything about an intact human heart with a much more mature ventricular cardiomyocyte, for example, separated from the lungs by a barrier, a series of barriers, and where you know, and how would the virus get there, and that sort of thing. Uh, so, so what we what what do we know? We know that there is uh, there there is this myocarditis-like thing that can happen in in patients, uh, but when people have done, have actually looked for viruses. You can find them rare, only rarely in cardiomyocytes. And, and people have done this by electron microscopy, uh, which is hard. And they've done this by inside you hybridization and, and other sorts of, of higher uh, you know, survey level, level technologies. And so it's rare and it's a cell here and a cell there with a, with a dot denominator of many thousands. So it, it isn't like it's just sweeping through the heart, it, it, it infecting from cell to cell the way it does in the culture dish. Uh, when I talk to people who are doing virology work, they say that this is often, when you have asynchronous infections, it's hard to see viruses caught in the act and that sort of thing. So they weren't terribly surprised by that. I think a little skepticism is healthy. And so, I mean, I, maybe I'll just leave it there. So this is, I, I consider this evidence, but by no means proof. Great. So Adam, Eng Adam Engler wants to know, uh, with your Medusa cells, due to the hyperpolarization, do you see that the iPSCs are easier to push either into ventricular cardiomyocytes versus uh, atrial cardiomyocytes? Oh, what an interesting question. Uh, and hey, Adam, by the way, uh, I don't, we haven't really looked at that. The the EP data that we have are less than a month old right now, and so we haven't done uh, the 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 careful characterization of the percent atrial cells in our in our culture. So I'll just say thank you for that suggestion. I'll keep it in mind as, as we do as we do further characterization. Robert Angler wants to know whether the Medusa cells couple and conduct normally. Do they contract with? Uh, the engrafted heart, and I guess an extension of that is also, when you do engraft them, do they also increase ejection fraction the way you would expect? Th those are those are good, and also, hey Bob, a long time no see. Uh, the, there are that those are those are really good questions. Uh, it's going to take. We're going to do all of those experiments, and we haven't done any of them because literally these are all very new, unpublished data. But we, we need to do all of that. The, the concern is we may have edited ourselves out of 
yes, you, we've edited our way out of, out of the arrhythmia, but have we edited ourselves out of efficacy also? And so we need to show that they are equipotent with wild type cells in terms of restoring contractile function. Neil Chi she has a follow up question. Uh, is there heterogeneity in your cardiomyocyte uh, uh, preparation? Uh, yes. Uh, there, there's, there's, there are, there are non-myocytes as well as myocytes, and within myocytes there are, there's heterogeneity as well. And we've done this by single cell RNA sequencing and, and lots of different uh, uh, assays. I mean, the, the, of course, any cell preparation has heterogeneity. I mean, Jane Lubkowski always used to say the only pure population is a single cell. And, 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 and so it, it, all, it all depends. Like, have, has anyone ever seen a single cell RNA sequencing experiment that didn't show heterogeneity, right? I mean, uh, so, so it, 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 part of this is, is it heterogeneous in a, in a way that, that's interesting or useful? Um, and we, we have mostly ventricular cells. The, this this uh, sequential Wnt modulation pathway fortuitously gives you principally ventricular myocytes. When we transplant them in, we end up with 99% of the cells expressing myosin light chain 2V, which is a pretty good ventricular uh, isoform. And so, so, that's a, so I, I think fortuitously we get mostly ventricular cardiomyocytes. Um, but there, we have, but by action potential characteristics, we have cells with more rapid and, and less rapid upstrokes and things. And you could argue at the action potential level are some of these atrial and some of these ventricular. And so the, the, the short answer is, there is there's dispersion there. There's a bandwidth of dispersion of phenotype. Uh, the the non-myocyte populations comprise typically less than 10%. Those are mostly fibroblastic cells. Okay, I'm going to bunch a few other questions together because these actually deal with uh, trying to do clinical trials using these cells. Uh, Suzanne Peterson would like to know exactly how many cells would you need to do in a patient, and is that feasible? Uh, uh, Rob Tressler is asking, is that dose feasible in an actual patient? And then how durable do you think this effect will be? Yeah. So um, the, the dose in the human, the low end, we, we, first, I mean, we don't really know. What we need to do is dose finding studies for, we, we know that a dose of uh, I'll just speak in round numbers of, of 10 to the ninth works in a monkey. Uh, we, we've not tried efficacy studies in the pig, uh, mostly because the pigs were so sensitive to engraftment arrhythmias that, the, that they couldn't tolerate higher doses of cells. So I, I would say the, the low end of a dose range in a human study that would be efficacious would be 10 to the ninth. So it's probably 10 to the ninth to 10 to the 10th cells, which is, of course, 10 billion. That's a ton. But we can we can a single three liter bioreactor run can make uh, can make ten billion cardiomyocytes. Uh, so we it can we do it? Yes. Will it be cheap at the beginning? No. It'll be super expensive. Um, part of the problem is that at best ten percent you know ten fifteen percent of the cells end up living, and so we if we could if we could figure out the pathogenesis of graft cell death, we would markedly drop cost of goods and services and that sort of thing. We'd be able to get more bang for our buck there. But I, th I think it's feasible. I'm sorry, there, the, the, the second part of the question was, was what can you remind me, please? How durable would this be? Durable, effect? yeah, thank you. Uh, we, the, the longest that we've gone out has been three months and the graphs get bigger from one month to three months. And so this is as long as you keep the immune system at bay, right? So this is, this is in the context of immunosuppression. Uh, our plan going into the clinic is with immune engineering to make cells so-called hypoimmune. Uh, so the, the, I think the big, I, th I think if we can keep the immune system at bay, these cells will last principally the life of the patient, which is how long your cardiomyocytes usually last. Do, do those cardiomyocytes divide or do they stay quiescent? So, so the, the, one of the advantages of the immaturity of the stem cell derived cardiomyocytes is that it, they are proliferative. And so they, they will proliferate the grafts typically, you know, when you, you transplant them in, you go through uh, a process of, of cell death and you lose 90% and then they rebound and they increase about seven fold or so in number from nadir to plateau. And this is small animal data. And so they, they do divide for a while and then they gradually slow down. So 
the continued proliferation you don't envision as being a, a game changer or a, a, a game ender, right? Once you've done it. Right. Uh, so I, I'm not worried about uh, like making a cardiac rhabdomyoma or, or something like that in the heart. I, I mean, of course, we're, we keep our eyes open for everything, right? Some kind of uncontrolled overgrowth is something we're very worried about. We're working on safety switches so that, you know, heaven forbid, if, if a tumor-like mass should arise, we could debulk it, et cetera. Uh, but we, 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 simply haven't, we simply haven't seen that despite, uh, no matter how many cells we have we've put into the heart, we've never had like something that bulged and, and changed the, the um, changed the, the shape of the wall or interfered with emptying or filling. Sticking with the uh, with the with with the VTAC, it's interesting that the monkeys did not show the same phenomenon that uh, that the pigs did, and that the that the monkeys, after an initial phase of VTAC, seemed to at least accommodate to it or suppress it. Do you I guess do you envision the same thing being the case in humans? And given that there's a critical period. How would you support these patients to, let's assume that they're the same as the monkeys and that there is this very critical window, but then after that, they're fine. How would you, what would be the post-op following of a patient who you successfully transplanted? Would they be hospitalized for a few months or monitored for a few months or on ventricular assist or something like that. Right, uh, all, all, all great questions. And so this of course presumes that we don't use the gene editing tricks that, that, that seem to have knocked it out, right? Uh, the, so we, we have found pharmacology helps. It's, not, it's by no means perfect, but it helps. And we've, we've surveyed major antiarrhythmic classes and found that a cocktail of amiodarone plus evabridine suppress both the percent of time in the arrhythmia and the rate while in the arrhythmia. And it's really more the rate response than it is the fact that you, I mean, it, it's, it's a little dissynchronous if you're contracting, if your impulse is originated by the graft. But, it, it, but if you can keep the rate down, I think it's the tachycardia that gets really lethal in the pigs. Uh, the, diff the principal difference between the monkey and the pig is not so much the time that, you know, the, 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 that the monkey suppresses it, I think it's, first pigs are just super susceptible to arrhythmias. Pigs fibrillate uh, during shipping and things like that in the meat industry. And, and so they're a really arrhythmogenic animal. And second, I think a bigger, you know, their heart is seven times bigger than a monkey heart. And a bigger heart takes longer to fill. It takes longer to empty. And it's going to tolerate 250 beats a minute less well than a small heart will. Uh, and you start to interfere with uh, coronary perfusion during diastole and things. You shorten your diastolic intervals down and down. Uh, big hearts need more diastolic perfusion time. And so I, I think, you know, the, I, I, I'm, I'm talking too long, sorry, but the, that I, I think that the, it's, it's partly size and just partly species. Pigs have a different electrical system and are known to be much more arrhythmogenic than the monkey. I think we'll end with uh, one last question going back to your COVID-19 work, and it's from... Rob Tressler, and I guess it's somewhat philosophical and somewhat uh, epidemiological. Despite all the nice work you've shown in vitro with regard to your cardiomyocytes, when you actually look at patients, what proportion of the cardiac mortalities are confirmed to be due to frank cytopathic effects on the heart cells versus more systemic cardiovascular instability due to cytokine storm or other aberrant immune responses? Yeah. Uh, so l let me, th there's sort of a two sides to that, right? This percentage and that percentage. The, 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 the first part, what percent is frank cytopathic effect in the human heart? Almost zero. I mean, I, I am not really aware of any uh, autopsy study that's been done that shows that this person's heart lysed, if you will, from cytopathic effect, right? Uh, but I'll say on the other hand, I don't know any study that has proven that the people who went into heart failure, that this is from cytokine storm or, you know, that sort of thing. These, these are really hard things to untangle. So we, for sure, for sure I know of none that, that showed direct cytopathic effect killed a patient. Uh, but, but it's really hard to untangle other mechanisms of, from, from thrombosis to electrical instability to mechanical failure, et cetera. Those, those are also similarly hard to untangle. And so there, there's just there's simply much we don't know, and you know very few COVID patients got autopsied, 
um, OSHA came out and recommended that, uh, or, or dictated that basically people not do autopsies on COVID for reasons of public health safety uh, and work, workplace safety and that sort of thing. And um, so, so there, there's been precious few autopsies done on, on COVID patients. It'd be interesting to do more and learn more about it. So, uh, uh, but, but again, I, I, think, I think some skepticism here is healthy. You know, cell culture systems have limited abilities to tell us uh, what's going on inside of complex patients. I will say when you look at lungs of COVID patients, you see a cell and you do inside your hybridization for the virus, you see a cell here and you see a cell there, but, but it isn't just like, you know, in these lungs that have ARDS and stuff like that, you don't see it's just chalk block full of viral particles either. They're, they're, it's easier than finding them in the heart, but not as easy as I imagined when I was un, unexposed to, to it. This is a great presentation, uh, John. Yeah, you've been getting through the Q and A. You've been getting all kinds of kudos for it. Um, so thanks so much, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks so much, Chuck. Thanks for everybody. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Bye bye. bye.